you can look at the evolution of gaining command of the air and initially we had unarmed aircraft patrolling the lines over you know, the fields of France in, uh, in World War I. One day some intrepid young officer, flyer, went up there with a gun. The beginnings are really in World War I and both sides had ideas about how to gain control of the airspace over the front and, and they tried different things. None of it worked very well, but in the end, the Allies simply were able to overwhelm the Germans because of their production capacity and their ability to train and field pilots. World War II is where air superiority and the recognition across the joint force came in, that you have to have air superiority in order to allow our surface forces to maneuver, to mass, and then to apply effects. Uh, imagine, if you will, the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan and an undefeated German Air Force overhead. I think D-Day would have been imperiled, and if we had pulled it off, it would have been at a much higher cost uh, that uh, would have been unnecessary. My preference is that we don't allow anybody to inflict that on us. So I think in the popular mind, it, 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 it goes unremarked. Nobody says, hey, there's no German Air Force in Saving Private Ryan. That's exactly right. There's no German Air Force because we took care of it ahead of time. Since then, when we talk historically, the Korean War was probably the last example where our ground forces faced an attack by a hostile air-breathing platform. And it was in the skies over North Vietnam where we last faced an extended struggle in the air for air superiority. We haven't had to do anything like that since. A key piece of air superiority is not only my ability to use the air, but my desire to keep the enemy from using the air. I don't have to use airplanes to do that. And you saw during uh, Vietnam and through, you know, the, particularly the Arab-Israeli War in 1973, the rise of integrated air defenses and their effectiveness against aircraft that are not equipped to counter that type of a threat. You get the Desert Storm and Desert Shield. Uh, the Iraqi Air Force only challenged us in 1991 on the first night of operations. But we went after air superiority by going after their airfields and we put them out of action in a big way. We used runway busters, we broke their uh, hardened aircraft shelters, and if they came up, we shot them down. And we got air control and then air superiority very quickly in that war. Uh, but we had many more airplanes, we had many better pilots, better airframes. It was all kind of one-sided, to be perfectly frank. I don't know anybody in uniform, any sane military commander that would say, I really don't want or need air superiority. That it's the effect, it, it really shouldn't come down to how that effect is achieved. And oftentimes, I think we in the Air Force get into this, this do loop, if you will, of, of trying to talk about a technology when really what we are trying to talk about in the broadest sense is the effect that we're seeking to gain through the, that technology. This modern force that we're operating is now leading us down paths uh, where we have created a joint force that is integrated under the umbrella of air power in a way that was previously unimaginable. My fear is, is that that assumption of air superiority moving forward will blind us to the way we plan to fight that joint force. Air superiority is the first, in my mind, the first and most important part of integrating a joint force. So what types of, of platforms, airframes, weapon systems do we need to, uh, to gain and sustain air superiority? I think technology has evolved to the point now that m many of the same platforms will be used in a host of other missions, but specifically for this mission, obviously you need, you need agile, maneuverable aircraft. We'll call them fighters those flying in an air-to-air -air role, but then are also capable of striking targets on the ground uh, that are capable of uh, a certain degree of self-defense against uh, enemy, enemy IADs, integrated air defenses on the ground. Another sandwich, another sandwich, same location. So now we've got a situation where we're not only facing more capable air threats on a continuing basis, we're facing more capable surface-to-air threats, which present another challenge for our ability to, uh, to seize control of the airspace and then use it while it's going on. So missiles with uh, greater acquisition capability, 
greater range, greater maneuvering, make it that much more challenging for us to, to grab and uh, to seize and maintain that, uh, that command of the air. We just assume nobody's ever going to come up and meet us in the air. We've opened a window of vulnerability that they'd be idiots not to walk through. We have to make sure that we don't present them with that window of opportunity or create a window of vulnerability. Uh, if they have aircraft that can fly higher, faster, and farther, that presents a challenge for us to counter those specific types of threats. So we have to be able to reach as high, fast, and as far as they are with either our aircraft or more importantly the weapons that we use to counter those. So the reality is, is this threshold between where we are and where our adversaries are is so great they don't even invest in trying to close that gap. They look for alternatives, less effective alternatives to challenge us. But we're changing also. Space and cyber are increasingly important to gaining air superiority in ways we do not traditionally think of today. Since World War II, airmen have recognized that they need to wage two fights. The first to gain air superiority, the second then to exploit that air superiority in support of the joint fight. Although the joint fight is the number one priority, sequentially gaining air superiority must occur first. We will eventually move to a point where the capability exists to conduct air superiority missions without a man in the cockpit. As machines get more and more complex and capable, what we actually do is we should de design them so that they allow humans to leverage the specific capabilities that humans have and let machines leverage the specific capabilities that we can put in with machines. Technology is always a threat to anything you do militarily. You have to be able to try and find out everything you can about it before you have to face it. Uh, new weapon systems are always a threat and you have, to, you have to do the best you can to get in front of those things and know about them before you are confronted by them. So how do we integrate this notion of air superiority into a, a joint professional military education? I, I think is critical. At a tactical level, that may involve weapons and tactics and those kinds of things, but the, at the more senior level, at the strategic level, thinking about air superiority requires a longer view. Those students need to be thinking about things like the industrial base, uh, budget priorities, they also need to be thinking where that would fit in a broader campaign, the necessary conditions for, for attaining victory. We're all worried about what uh, Chinese missiles can do and what Chinese aircraft can do, and that's part of air superiority. You've got to be able to control those things uh, if you go to war. Better not to go to war, but if you have to, you've got to be ready for it.